Good afternoon. I want to thank all of you for coming out tonight. This is our opening lecture for our Food for Thought series. Um, and we have with us tonight Dr. Chris Grimian from The Ohio State University, um, where she is a professor in the Department of Anthropology. And she's going to be speaking with us tonight about multi-ethnic communities, the evolution of Southern cuisine. Dr. Grimian um, is a very well-renowned archaeobotanist or paleoethnobotanist um, with over 25 publications in peer-reviewed journals, her most recent in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science. Two books, one of which just came out last year, Ancestral Appetites. If you haven't checked it out yet, it's certainly worth a good read. Um, and, and over 25 different book chapters and publications. So she comes to us with a lot of specialization, her, her area of expertise, of course, being in uh, Eastern North America, um, as well as, as Southeastern North America, um, some of which she's going to be sharing with us tonight, and the concept of, of cultural contact and how diets have been made over time through, through different cultural fusions and dissemination. So without further ado. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, thank you. Um, that was a very nice introduction, so I hope I can live up to it. Um, as Paul said, what I'm going to talk about today is specifically uh, about how diets and food practices change in contexts in which you have different cultural systems coming together for the first time. And of course, uh, the Americas are sort of a natural laboratory for that process because of the fact that uh, Native American people had been uh, evolving culturally on those two continents for well over 10,000 years by the time Europeans figured out they were there. So it was a rather sudden and in many ways devastating contact of cultures. So I want to talk a little bit about what I've learned over the years in trying to piece together, my question is always why? You know, why is one plant or food accepted and why are some rejected? You know, why is that the case? Why do some regions develop what you might call a fusion cuisine that incorporates all these different elements, you know, into a single diversified way of eating as opposed to situations in which that just doesn't happen. So I'm kind of going back to my graduate school days here. So that's what I started out doing as a paleoethnobotanist. You know, my dissertation work was on contact period Native American communities in North Carolina and how they adapted to the European presence, particularly which plant foods they chose to um, utilize from the uh, European set of useful plants. So, you know, I had that perspective and began to make some observations. And I guess this is the way science really works, that you make os observations, you, you create hypotheses, and you kind of incorporate some theory. And so what I've been able to do over the years from studying these Native American communities and also some multi-ethnic communities, which were also in the southeast, that were rather different. Um, I also had an opportunity to work on some of those. And those were situations, they were colonies in which Native American people, enslaved Africans, and Europeans from different countries were all uh, interacting with each other. So I think these are two very different situations. So with my background in evolutionary theory, I developed a model, as yet untested, but a model for thinking about how social interaction influences those outcomes. So that's the gist of today's talk. Um, so the cultural roots of Southern cuisine. As a native New Orleanian, this is something that I've been exposed to and thought about for a really long time. New Orleans cuisine is a great example of a fusion cuisine. Um, and throughout the Southeast, you know, there, there were these different foods that came in from different places. Uh, of course, maize is native. Uh, squashes and gourds are native varieties of those, even native to Eastern North America that had been around for a long time. Uh, there were Eurasian plants like the peach that were introduced. The Spanish introduced a lot of tree crops 
when they establish missions. Uh, and then African uh, foods like the uh, black eyed pea or cow pea, watermelon, those were uh, originated in Africa and some of these crops and also okra are things that were actually used to provision uh, enslaved Africans on their journey across the Atlantic. So they ended up here too. And so it's sort of creating a melting pot effect. But there are different ways that this can happen, different outcomes. So in terms of the two kinds of communities that I've had an opportunity to study, uh, the first example are these Native American communities of the interior southeast. So these were uh, communities that were somewhat buffered from European presence. They were independent uh, villages. They had contact with Europeans through trade networks, but they didn't have European households nearby. So they were still somewhat separated. And typically in that early stage of contact, the native people, at least in, in the southeast, kind of had the upper hand in trade relations. Because they had things the Europeans wanted and were willing to trade for, but they didn't really have any pressure to adopt European culture. So they were able to be sort of selective. Um, then there are these multi-ethnic communities such as uh, Colonial New Orleans very early on and Old Mobile, which is the original site of what is today the city of Mobile, both French colonies. And both of those situations produced fusion cuisines. And I, I got a picture of jambalaya. I now realize that when it's made large, it looks like, I don't know what it looks like. It doesn't even look like food, but that's what that is, jambalaya. Uh, delicious, trust me, it really is. Uh, but it's got you know the elements of things like jambalaya and gumbo. They, they really mix up local foods, uh, European cuisines, you know, all kinds of things. And they, they come together to make these dishes that are really unique. Um, so that's what I decided to think about, and it kind of sort of fell in my lap. Come on, come on, please. Okay, we'll use this. Didn't like that. Okay, so this is my own personal, this is something I talk about in, in my book. Uh, my understanding of human diet, dietary choices, why people eat the things they eat, is that there are three important ingredients, if you will, if you want to carry on with a culinary metaphor. Um, we've got one uh, very omnivorous primate. So that's Homo sapiens. We're adapted biologically to eat almost anything. You know, real, people worldwide survive on such a wide range of things. Even to get adequate nutrition, you know, there are many different ways to achieve that. So we can eat all kinds of things. We can cook. You know, that, that solves a lot of um, problems with food consumption. We also have a very ex extreme degree of behavioral uh, flexibility. So this is a difference in degree from other animal species. Other primates are also very flexible, they can eat different things, but we have a really extreme degree of it. Um, our ability to, um, to modify our behavior in response to the environment. So that gives us an amazing shortcut, a really useful shortcut. We don't have to wait, uh, well, it allows us to do a lot of experimenting with what's in the environment. Okay, some other animals do that. What humans have that's really special, though, is this third thing. We have culture. And to me, culture is a system of cumulative social learning. So not only do we learn from conspecifics, we pass that knowledge on to children, uh, and also we pass on that knowledge horizontally to others in the group. So we're not constrained by biological inheritance. And that's a really powerful adaptive tool. And I think that if you're going to explain food choice, you've got to think about all three of these things at some point or another. Not all at once, because then we lose our minds trying to figure out complex problems. Uh, but it's the social learning aspect that I'm going to talk about today. <clears throat> 
So when cultural systems come into contact, uh, there are opportunities for adoption of novel foods. Why are some foods adopted maybe very rapidly and others are not? That's the question I want to answer. And I want to know specifically what role does the transfer of information play? Because, you know, things uh, move around. The plants themselves, the seeds, whatever, propagation, uh, uh, propagules, you know, can be transferred or even finished food products can be transferred. But the question is, you know, how does information affect that process? And I think I, the reason I got this way in my thinking is that initially I thought in terms primarily of economic costs and benefits. And that's a very useful model. It explains many aspects of human behavior, but it doesn't explain everything. Okay, so moving on to the southeastern case. Uh, here are some of the plants. I don't know how well you can see it in the back. Probably my design, slide design choice was not the best for this room. But um, plants that made their way into the southeast, these are only the ones that were not native. Well, that, that's not exactly true. The top two, maize was native to Mesoamerica, sunflower native to eastern North America as a domesticate, um, common beans from Mexico. Then you have South American crops like the Andean potato, sweet potato, uh, from the tropics, then a bunch of African foods, crops, and a number of things introduced from Europe and Asia, and many of these were introduced by the Spanish, who brought in all kinds of things. Their goal uh, in setting up colonies was to create, they wanted to get a foothold, they wanted to enslave the local, basically enslave the local Indian people and, you know, have them produce food. So they brought in a lot of Mediterranean crops. That's how those got here. So what, is the, what, what are the fates of these different foods? So first I'll talk about these native communities. These largely independent, uh, but trading with Europeans. Okay, one of them is um, the basis of my dissertation work. It was a place <laughs> called Okanichi Town. That's its historic name. Uh, a site on the um, uh, Eno River in North Carolina. And the other one was uh, the Fusahatchee Village. This is a village of the Upper Creek people. Uh, the, the two sites date to about the same time. So they're both historically known sites that have been investigated archaeologically. Okay, in the case of, uh, this is a, a map of Okanichi Village, and you can see that the archaeologists have completely excavated the entire site. So this is a view, it's a plan view. You can see the palisade going around the village. So it's a fortified village. You can see there's a line of graves. They were burying their dead outside of the village, right outside, and structures, a bunch of circular houses. So this whole site was dug. That, that's not usually done anymore. You know, usually archaeologists, now Paul's laughing, because, you know, the idea is to conserve some of archaeological resources for the future. Um, and this was on private land, so it could have been so preserved. But anyway, never mind about that. Okay, but the whole site was, was excavated, so you get a beautiful look at, you know, the, the whole village and all its components. Uh, I don't think there, was any, there were any Europeans living here. These people, the Okanichi, were uh, known for being trade intermediaries. They were people who bought cheap from Europeans and sold dear to their uh, uh, neighbors farther into the interior. So they made a very good living that way. They had, you know, they had wine, rum, rum bottles. They had pipes. They had metal goods. They had pretty much anything that. They they were very wealthy. They skimmed off the good stuff, you know, and then sold the rest. So what did they have as far, oh, okay, I'm sorry. Um, I should go back there, which is not going to be easy. Use the arrows on the keyboard. Ish. Never mind, I'm going to previous. <laughs> 
dun, 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 dun. okay. Anyway, okay, so uh, Okanichi Village and other villages in the area around the same time, they had acquired peaches, and peaches are one of the most resistant things. If you think about what a peach pit is like, those things last forever. If they're burned, they're carbonized, they last forever archaeologically. So we get lots of peach pit fragments. Um, the other things that were found in this area, the other introduced plant crop was the watermelon, and there's one seed from a nearby site. Watermelon, not too many chances for it to get burned, you know, unless you spit the seeds into the fire, you know, you don't need to cook it. So, so that's um, the central North Carolina picture, and then from Fusahatchee Village, I discovered there was one burned structure that was full of black-eyed peas. Only example I know of that plant from an interior site. Turns out that it was there on Spanish coastal sites, places like St. Saint, Saint Augustine, the missions. Uh, now that's an African crop, and it's believed that it ended up in North America because it was uh, brought over on slave ships. What's it doing in this interior village? I have no idea. It could be a, just a unique occurrence. I don't know for a fact that they were growing, that, that the native peoples were growing it. Um, it's an unusual condition. It was a, a building that had burned down. Everything in it was burned at once. So maybe they just bought it. Maybe they weren't growing it. But they had it and apparently had some, some use for it. So that was the picture around the late 1600s, early 1700s. That's when trade was indirect. And if you look much later, or at least late 18th century villages, it took that long. It was a couple of centuries before those villages actually had European neighbors. And that's when they started adopting things like horses and cattle and the plow and some of uh, the sweet potatoes, some European uh, techniques of farming. So it's a really delayed effect situation. Okay? It took really until European settlement in the mid-1700s before that happened. So looking at all of these, this whole array of uh, plants that were adopted by these independent native communities, the things I noticed about them, first of all, they all seem to have native analogs. So the peach, you know, uh, native peoples had uh, plums, cherries, there were a lot of native fruits, persimmons, and even grew them in, they tended them. You know, they, they didn't have orchards the way that we think of orchards as being very orderly, but they did maintain and tend and take care of those trees. So the peach was just one more. Peaches practically, they, spread themselves. You ever throw a peach pit out and come back, you know, and it starts, it sprouts? How long does it take for you to have peaches? You know? Three to five years. So this plant, which the Spanish brought in to uh, the Atlantic coast and the Gulf coast, it got into the interior apparently all by itself. It was so weedy and so easily naturalized that the Indian people in the interior believed that they had always had it. It had become part of their cultural tradition. So they had no idea it came from Europeans, that it came from Asia. So that's one thing. Um, likewise, the cowpeas, similar to beans that people had already. So that was one observation. None of these items that were adopted readily were staple foods. So that meant that it was not very risky to experiment with them. You can afford to, you know, throw a, a new type of bean in, into your field with your other beans and your maize and see how it does. Not a big deal if it doesn't work out. And then the other thing is that they're relatively low cost and high yielding kinds of foods. So that's what got me thinking. Uh, one thing that I kept thinking about over the years is this business of having native analogs. What exactly? Is there something measurable about that? Because I think like a scientist, at least part of the time, you know, 
is there something measurable? Can we say something more than just native analogs? What does that why does that make it easier? Why does that make cultural <coughs> transmission actually happen? So proud of this. Let me tell you. <laughs> I, I worked so hard on this thing, you know. I've had to let it do its thing. But yeah, I mean, social interaction does matter. You know, there's a cluelessness. I mean, think about corn. Corn is weird. It's a grass. I mean, come on, what grass looks like that? You know, wheat doesn't look anything like it. It's this giant, you know, cob with these big fat kernels stuck to it. I mean, if you just saw that, you know, you'd never seen it before, you would go, huh? You know, what is this? I like to tell people I have a, a, a German relative who knew somebody who, uh, who was from Germany, had, came to the U.S., had never seen corn, had only had corn out of a can, and saw it in the store and said, how did they get those little things on that stick, you know? It's like, but I mean, it's that level of unfamiliarity that you have to kind of put, you know, take a step back from it and realize, yeah, we take corn for granted, but what a bizarre looking thing. So as opposed to, you know, actually learning, you know, watching, seeing, observation, imitation, learning can be very important. So it does make a difference. And I think the thing with the crucial, one of the crucial factors with the difference between those, uh, the, the North Carolina and um, uh, Alabama villages and the multi-ethnic communities that I'll talk about is that they didn't have that social interaction. So their adoptions of things were things that didn't require a lot of learning from other people. That's my hypothesis anyway. We'll see if the model works out. Okay, then we have these multi-ethnic communities. Um, the Spanish missions were Certainly multi-ethnic communities, they were run on different, using different rules. You know, the Spanish objectives in the New World were um, distinctive. You know, they, they would come in, they would put up a presidio, a church. They would take the indigenous peoples and baptize them, make them all Catholics, force them to labor for the mission to feed the priests. and. That was just how they did things. Well, it didn't work out in the long run, but um, that was their strategy. So the French were also very active, and, and the English a little bit later. But the two French colonies that I had the opportunity to study plant materials from are Old Mobile and New Orleans. Um, I was fortunate to be invited to participate in a project uh, run by Shannon Doughty, University of Chicago. Um, she's very interested in the process of creolization, uh, you know, from an anthropological perspective, and she uses that in her archaeological work. So she uh, has been working on, among other things, um, initially her work was on trying to reconstruct some of the gardens in New Orleans with an eye to reconstructing some that have been vantaged, uh, damaged by Katrina. Uh, the Old Mobile Project was, you know, an archaeological project that looked at the initial settlement that was only there between 1702 and 1711, and then it moved to where the present uh, city is. So I looked at plant remains from both of these places. Whoops. Okay, now you're working. Good. That's fine. That's okay. I can, I can deal with that. Um, so, more observations. What do I find from Old Mobile, which also usefully for me as an archaeobotanist, had burned structures? Beautiful. It's like Pompeii, you know? You don't have to rely on things that people threw away. They had everything in storage, and then, foof, it all went up in flames and burned everything nicely. Bad for them, good for us. I found fava beans, a Mediterranean crop. What's that doing there? Tons and tons of fava beans. Not even that common among us, you know, even today in American cuisine. Although it's at least known, people know that it exists. But there it was. And um, these early colonies, I know, were 
I know that Old Mobile, the French were illegally trading with the Spanish. You know, they were doing under the table because they needed food. They were a colony. They just got plopped down. They, you know, had to get food somehow. So they did a lot of under the table trading. And that's my guess about where the fava beans came from, uh, was from the Spanish. So, you know, archaeobotanically, I won't bore you with the details, but you know, I was able to do comparisons to show definitely based on the morphology that that's what that plant was. Not hard to recognize, okay? So, um, observations about Old Mobile. Um, one thing, and this comes from the historical as well as the archeological evidence, is that the colonists quickly adopted maize. And that's the case, I think, throughout the South probably the north too. I mean, if there's one plant from Native America that made its way quickly and irrevocably into American cuisine, it would be maize. Um, why not? You can't grow, wheat doesn't grow well in the southeast. You know, a lot of these crops failed. Uh, maize was already here. It was already adapted to conditions. People knew how to grow it. Why wouldn't you? Great source of calories. Um, this is just, this illustrates some of that. Um, the white bar there is, is maize and showing its um, density per gram of plant remains in these different structures. So it was very high. And there were a lot of legumes too and peaches, but those are not, uh, were not things that the indigenous people used, but were adopted. Now these communities, you know, they were probably European households, but they weren't necessarily all European people living in them. At that time, they had sometimes uh, enslaved Native Americans. They had enslaved Africans, uh, Europeans of different backgrounds, and free Indians, and so there was a, a, a mix. So one of Shannon Dottie's projects involved excavations right behind the St. Louis Cathedral. So if you know New Orleans and you know the cathedral, which is the major landmark, you know, it's where everyone goes. That cathedral was built in the 19th century, the one that's there now. Right behind it, there's a garden, and it's known as St. Antoine's Garden or the Anthony Garden. Uh, Père Antoine, famous historical figure, um, is associated with it. And Dottie's work involved trying to figure out what was planted in this garden originally or through the centuries so that they could try to reconstruct it. So we didn't find as much as we hoped. Um, basically, the phytolith evidence, phytoliths are little silica bodies, <coughs> microscopic sized, and, and they showed that there were a lot of palms. Well, duh, you know, it's, it's <laughs> you know, that's what grows there now too, so it's, you know, not all that surprising. <coughs> However, there were some really early deposits, and um, according to the other archaeological evidence, um, Dottie surmised that the earliest work crews who were basically founding, this was actually before the city was a city, it was before <coughs> 1718 when it was founded, but even before that, the first work crews who were there clearing away and you know, building were probably ethnic, ethnically diverse. And uh, they had, among the plant remains, maize and beans contributed by the American Indian people, and then wheat, which is something the Europeans had. This, by the way, I don't want to offend anybody, but this is a, a statue of Jesus and, with outstretched arms, and one of his fingers, his index finger, is missing. Well, local New Orleanians, it's a very Catholic city. People call it Touchdown Jesus for obvious reasons. But the finger uh, came off in Katrina. And some people believe that that was Jesus rerouted the storm and lost his finger in the process. And that's why it didn't make a direct hit. So who am I to argue with local folklore? You know? I think they may have found the finger. I think in the dig, they found the, the finger. Yeah, I don't know if they put it back on. I digress. Okay. Uh, <laughs> continuing on, 
another one of the sites that Dottie worked at was the uh, Ursuline Convent Garden. And um, so I looked at some plant remains there. It was not very productive uh, in terms of food remains, which is what I was really interested in. Um, I did learn that the chief of police gets to live in the house that's right back next to the Ursuline Convent. We won't go into that, but uh, New Orleans police. Um, but this was another place that was intended for garden reconstruction. Um, there's a lot of very good historical data, though, um, about the kinds of people and the kinds of communities that were there. Um, today, this garden is planted and some of the crops introduced. Citrus was introduced early in the history of the city. Okra, essential, well, depending on who you talk to, essential for gumbo. Uh, figs do well de there. So a lot of these Spanish Mediterranean crops did quite well in New Orleans. So thinking about these sites, what was the sociocultural context? One thing that the French did differently from the English in their colonial uh, efforts, they encouraged intermarriage between native people and Europeans. They encouraged that as a way to develop the community. Uh, so they really encouraged that kind of uh, um, close interaction. And many early, uh, the early French explorers and fur traders, you know, took indigenous wives, or they had mistresses. Early on in colonization, the women didn't come, usually. It was just men initially. And so that kind of made for a situation where there was a lot of intermarriage. Um, they're very culturally diverse communities. The other thing that I think bears thinking about here, there's also a lot of social inequality. <coughs> That's one of the paradoxes of New Orleans society, is that for many years, you know, enslaved Africans and Europeans living right next to each other, but very much, a great deal of social inequality, even after slavery was over. And that's one of the weird things about the city. You know, it's so mixed. There are people of color, you know, a lot of people who have mixed ancestry, though they may or may not talk about that. There's Native American influence. And yet, the paradox is with all that mixing and blending, there are still these social barriers. So um, here I want to briefly <laughs> introduce some theory. Not very much, just a little, little tiny bit. But I integrated these findings with um, a model of cultural evolution developed by uh, researchers, Pete Richardson and Rob Boyd. And they've, they've got a huge body of literature about cultural evolution. They have a model that they developed in which they see uh, culture as a system of inheritance. They realize it's not the same as biological inheritance because there's a lot more uh, slop in the system, I guess, uh, that, you know, and there's learning going on. So it's not, you know, perhaps as tightly structured or as, well, for that matter, neither is biological evolution anymore. But they recognize the differences in that culture is unique as a system of inheritance, but they, they believe strongly that that's what it is. So here you have the conservative element of cultural transmission. The inheritance-like element is that we learn as children, we learn for our parents and grandparents how things are done. This is how you make a gumbo. No, that roux is not dark enough. Keep cooking it. That's what we learn. This is what you eat on Sunday. And a certain amount of that, we absorb it, we accept it, we teach it to our own kids. Of course, we play around with it, and sometimes we break free of it completely. But there is that conservative, traditional aspect. Also, though, what gives culture its flexibility is that not only do we have that inheritance, which is a great shortcut, because then you don't have to learn everything each generation, try to figure out what to do. You have this information given to you. You also have the opportunity to kind of tweak it and play with it. So you can also learn 
things from other people about what works and what doesn't. You can uh, learn things from your own experimentation and you can incorporate that, combine it with the body of knowledge you've inherited, and then pass that package on. That's how we get cumulative learning. So I think that, that this model can be helpful in thinking about why social interaction is so important in the adoption or rejection of novel foods in these kinds of situations. One point that Richardson and Boyd make that I think is very intuitively obvious is that individual trial and error learning is costly. Whereas social learning, if you can get the same information from someone else who's gotten it from someone else who far, you know, that who has incorporated many generations of trial and error learning, you've got a bunch of the work done for you already. So social learning is a valuable, inexpensive shortcut. So I think it's going to have a big effect on what kinds of things get adopted. Uh, and in the case of novel foods, I think also it's important to think about the difference between the production of those foods or the production of the crops, the animals, whatever it is, and the production and processing, because those are very different things. Uh, sometimes, you know, the processing of foods, making them into something edible is very elaborate. Uh, so you get different, uh, different combinations of, of costs for these different phases of using new foods or trying new foods. So if it's expensive, if, if trial and error learning is expensive for a particular food stuff, it's going to be very important if there's a pathway for social learning that's going to make it more likely to be adopted. Okay, so now I'm going to hit you with a model which is going to make your brain blur. I tried to kind of simplify it. All right, so this is just how I think, all right? Two by two uh, contingency table. This is just a model. It's just a heuristic tool, okay? Nothing really scary about it. So what I'm reasoning, you know, production and the cost of in individual learning, low here, high here. Processing and consumption, cost of individual learning, high here, low here. So you can see that if, if the cost of individual learning are low for uh, consumption as well as for production, you're going to get things that are going to be picked up really fast. And that's where all of these um, fruits, I think, a lot of fruits end up here because you don't need to process it. You just have to figure out how to get inside it. You don't usually have to cook it. So those kinds of innovations, you know, they can occur very rapidly. Not much knowledge needed. Doesn't matter if you have a, someone to learn from or not. So kiwi fruit, I threw in there as an example, you know, it's become quite common. At the other extreme, you have things that are very, very costly to learn about on an individual level through trial and error. And a great, I think, a, I put tapioca because that's a form that manioc usually takes when you buy it in the store. Manioc is a plant that is highly toxic. It's cassava, also known as cassava. If you don't prepare it properly, and there's a, a long process, different things you have to do, different steps, if you don't get the toxins out of it, it, it will poison you and potentially kill you, right? So there, trial and error could be actually deadly. So if you, and, and uh, likewise, um, you know, in, I don't know how hard it is to grow in the tropics. It's probably pretty easy to grow, but it would be much harder up here to grow. So the production part of it, you know, might also be difficult. So there you get things that are going to be very slow to be transferred. Um, on the other hand, there are some things that don't, that, that are, you know, maybe easy to learn how to consume but not to produce or vice versa. So I, I was just, you know, I'm sitting down today coming up with stuff off the top of my head for this talk, but I think that a good example of something that um, is not costly to learn about as far as consumption, but is costly to learn about for production is chocolate. 
right? I mean, chocolate, people, you know, it's sweet. It's, you know, it's something that people naturally gravitate to. Eating it is not a problem. Getting people to eat it, not a problem. Producing it is something else, <laughs> again. And then you have the opposite situation where, um, and I put sushi by, for, for this example. So lack of social learning might get in the way of, of uh, consuming it and processing it. You know, it takes a lot to do that right. And it, it, you know, it gets a certain amount of effort to get people to value that as a food. Ew, ick, raw fish, right? But producing it, going out and catching fish, you know, not a big deal. So this is how I'm thinking about this model, which is largely untested. So if you go back to the southeastern foods that I'm thinking of here, and this is just, you know, totally untested. This is just guesswork about where these different uh, foods would fit. And down here, you see the peach, watermelon, fig, these fruits, right where you would expect them. Well, it's not surprising because I built the model partly based on those observations. So you need an independent test, which is what I hope to do next. But with some guesswork, you know, I, I would expect things like culinary herbs are very, you know, easy to grow usually. Give them some sun and they just kind of take care of themselves. But incorporating those flavors, you know, into dishes could require a lot of social learning. You know, you can do your experimentation. It's not going to hurt anything, but it might take a while without someone to learn from before you get good at it. So that's just sort of how I've structured the thinking about these things. I started this a number of years ago and put it aside, and now I'm getting back to it. So that's how I think social interaction can fit in. Uh, what kind of social interaction? Uh, and this is something, again, I'm thinking about uh, reviving <laughs> thoughts about this. Um, what kind of social interaction? Well, it's got to be non-hostile, you know, basically friendly interaction. The donor has to have the appropriate knowledge and I think it's also important to think about whether the recipient is empowered to make a choice. So one of the things that made me think this way is the idea that there are uh, multi-ethnic households in which there's enormous inequality. So you can have you know, enslaved women cooking meals for a family. That's got to, you know, potentially that's a route of social tra cultural transmission. But, you know, are those women empowered to pass that knowledge on? Is it going to be rejected? You know, and um, they often had care of children. And I know that's true in New Orleans. You know, very common for well-to-do uh, white families to employ African-American women to care for their children day in, day out, feeding them, looking after them. That's got to make a difference despite the inequality that's there. So I think that's something important that I want to look at in the future. <coughs> so the question of fusion cuisines, I think that's where we get those. I think they come from those situations in which you have multi-ethnic households and a lot of pathways for social learning to make that mix happen. Um, otherwise, you're not going to get gumbo. I mean, think about it. Okra, African, celery, onions, European, green peppers, South American, chili peppers, Mexican, local seafood, filet, which is uh, native uh, sassafras leaves, which go in there, and then rice, which, you know, is Asian rice, but it's Africans, West African, enslaved West Africans are the ones who taught Europeans how to grow it, because they had African rice. So the knowledge came from them even though not the plant, okay? So I think there are many, many avenues for research that kind of combine anthropology and history. And I hope you have not been too bored, um, but I'm, I'm finished. I wanna thank these people for giving me the opportunity to work on their materials. Thanks for listening.
We have about 15 minutes for questions. I know there's some folks that, that have to head out, and then we have a small reception in the, in the back out there um, in the faculty commons, so stick around for that. But I also, before we go forward, because I know folks are going to be heading out, want to make sure you know that our next um, speaker for, for Food for Thought is on October 23rd at 5 p.m. That's Bill Mosley. He's the chair of geography at McAllister College, and he's going to be talking about West Africa and food policy, and that'll be over in Ellis 1. 111, and there's a flyer in the back if you are interested in that. Um, but so let's take some time for questions. Yeah. Hi. Um, I teach in classics, and so I'm interested in uh, the difference between the work that men do and the work that women do mm -hmm. in these cultures. So uh, is there room in your model for foods that are relatively easy to grow if you've got heavy equipment, but Yes. Yeah, I think those foods really, really fit in. Uh, in case you didn't hear, she was asking about uh, is there room in the model for foods that are require a lot of what major equipment mm -hmm. to a lot of heavy technology to pr to produce them, produce them in, large quantities. in large quantities, but also maybe costly to process. Yes. Is that what you're asking? Uh, yeah. I mean, I think. I think that would fit in one corner of the of the model. Now, you know, this model just that is just looking purely at social interaction or the costs of trial and error learning. So there might be a different way to conceptualize that, the same way that there's a different way to cons to factor in gender, which I think is so important because, you know, women were in this situation and probably worldwide are the cooks. And they're often going to be the ones who are, who are processing the food. And so how could they not have a major impact you know, on things? Is there a particular situation that you have in mind that? Well, I was curious because you have the example of the, um, I guess it's the Cherokee and the Cree who mm -hmm. are um, by, 18, by late 1800s, they're adapt, adopting, I guess, um, horse-drawn flowers. Right. Right. And that whole model of, you know, store it in the barn over the, the winter. Uh, so how does that impact the, um, the labor situation? Yeah, well, I, yeah, I'm not exactly sure how to answer that. I know that the Europeans, you know, with their, you know, teaching, the, usefully teaching these people to do things they've been doing for millennia, but never mind, teaching them to do it the right way, which is with a plow and draft animals. They weren't talking to the women. They were talking to the men, and you know I think that caused a shift in work allocation. Um, but yeah, also slavery. yes, and some of the Cherokee households owned slaves too. So that that's a whole other, you know, separate consideration. I think. Mm -hmm. Well, I was kind of thinking about the factor of motivation. For some of these foods that may be a little higher, you know, more intensive mm -hmm. motivation relative to social interaction, trial. Right. Care. I'm thinking about everyone pretty much by now has busted the Walt Disney mythology around um, Johnny Appleseed. Right. So, right. So right. Knowing that that you know while that's a very personal you know um, thing to have in the kitchen, the apple you know there was applejack to be made. So um, about corn, so um, was there, did you ever find any indication of, you know, corn mash, liquor, you know, there, was there any kind of a, you know, that's a, that's a thing that takes a lot more uh, from a production standpoint, but the motivation <laughs> may have been there. Yes, yeah, so it's, it's really interesting. Yeah, I know that the, the, you know, liquor, rum, wine was imported very early. That was one of the desirable trade items. One of the buried individuals uh, at Okanichi Village had elevated lead levels, which probably came, could have come from consumption from those vessels. As far as direct evidence, um, the only thing I can think of is I also work in eastern Kentucky, and you know we find moonshine stills all the time, historic ones, recent ones. Um, you mean on the part of the, of the, of the indigenous adopting? 
they may have had yet, they may have had some other motivation, and I'm sure they did because corn was certainly the most uh, available source. You know, they experimented a bit with uh, grape wine. Uh, tried to you know use the native grapes for that and introduce the wine grape, so there was some of that going on. But yeah, I think corn liquor was, oh boy, we can do this here. You just have to do it with this. You know. Yeah, definitely. I think that was an additional motivation. Then you get into the psychotropic, you know, aspects of food. But yeah. So the cane crops in Louisiana came later. Yeah, I think that I think the cane probably came from the Caribbean. Was part, I'm not sure exactly how the sugar cane industry got started uh, or when. Um, Caribbean. You mean the the actual plant itself? Yeah, I'm not sure. Maybe, maybe it is does come from Arabia, but I'm not sure when it ended up. You know, part of the Louisiana economy. Yeah, I think it was one of the earlier things, though. Yes? What's the difference between the sources that the farmers have on local food that's more regulated, and do you think they're kind of changing their thinking about what local food is? You mean like now? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I haven't really thought too much about that, about she's asking about um, the local food movements currently and, and how these models might pertain to, to those. I guess it could be useful. Um, but of course, nowadays, I think in terms of archaeology, the distant past, um, when you can just ask people questions, um, you might not need the models so much. Or the models might help you to explain the way people feel about food. So it would be interesting to explore that ethnographically to try to find out whether whether this model even works. Yeah, it would be a good test of it. Yeah. Well, with the food movement as we have it here, would you think that we are moving back to social learning by the way we're now moving to small farms and I can go to the farmer's market and ask them what to do with Share that right. So right. there may be an actually a movement back to social learning as we're moving to organics and we're trying to remember and we can't remember the learning we've right. lost. Right. What am I going to do with all this kale? Right? <laughs> what am I going to do with all this Eat kale? It. Eat it. It's <laughs> great. But I had to learn when I had a, a exactly. I guess a CSA, you know, one year and, and it's like, what do I do with kale? They had to explain it to us, how to cook it. So yeah, I think you're right. I think that as, as opposed to all co- coming in as commodities uh, into the grocery stores where, I mean, you see something like an ugly fruit and say, what in the world, or a durian. As a, so, yeah, I know, right? <laughs> One of my students did the durian. I, I told them they, they should go out and find an unfamiliar food and learn about it by talking to shop owners and stuff. And always someone stumbles across that and just says, oh my gosh, smells terrible. Uh, worst thing I've ever seen. So those curiosities, yeah, they may not make it because they just show up in the grocery store because some buyer says, oh, that's cool, that's weird, maybe somebody will buy that. You know, it's $20 a pound. But you're right. So going to local food, you know, you actually talk to the farmers and they help you understand how to use these foods that we've grown so uh, so separated from. Yeah, it's a good point. Yeah. Well, you had said that you, you had some ideas about how you wanted to test this model uh-huh. in the future. And so maybe a way of, of bridging a few of these questions Jambalaya was such a great example because it's it's this living example of something that has this long history. Right. I'm wondering if there are other sort of dishes that still are in existence that you think I'd love to be able to apply it to my model to that and see if what's behind it works out. I, you know, gumbo 
I mean, really, right at the end, you know, I mean, that the mystery of gumbo, you know, and people have, there's bits and pieces of historical information, but we don't really know, you know, exactly what, what pieces came in and how they came in and, you know, who learned from whom that okra was a thickening agent and how did the sassafras leaves, I mean, that came from Native American people, but who got it and why, you know? So I have a talent for unanswerable questions, but that's your, yeah, you're right. It would be fascinating to try to track that down. Hey, well, I would invite you all to join us out um, in the lobby here. There's new cheese and some wine, I believe. Um, and just want to thank Dr. Kumi again for sharing. Thank you for having me.